Welcome to the Academy of Esports Podcast. I'm your host, James O'Hagan. Got a great uh, episode today. I'm here with Mr. Mike Russell and Dr. Christy Custer, both from uh, Kansas, the state of Kansas. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Now, uh, w- w- keeping with the Midwest theme of things, uh, me being in Wisconsin, but also being a child who grew up in Missouri, you all are in Kansas outside Wichita, correct? Yes, That's sir. correct. Just a little suburb outside of Wichita. In fact, uh, many of our students come from Northwest Wichita. Okay. And, you know, it's kind of nice that we have this Midwest thing going on. Uh, last episode, I interviewed uh, Bubba from uh, Gattert from uh, Varsity Esports Foundation. And I know that a lot of people seem to think that Santa Monica and Los Angeles or, um, you know, Japan or South Korea, these are hubs of, of gaming and the esports world. And what I've been finding as I do more and more work around esports, especially in education, there is a tremendous upswell of, of efforts in the Midwest, and, and you all are kind of leading an early uh, iteration of that. So we are Complete High School Maze. Complete and, High School Maze, sorry. Yep. Thank you. And we are the alternative school for our district. So our regular high school has about 1,200 kids. Actually, we have two high schools in our district. One of them has about 1,200 kids. The other one has about 1,000, and they both feed into Complete High School. And we'll have around 100 or so kids per year, and they graduate all through the year. Okay, so you're running an alternative ed program. So uh, a lot of credit recoveries, uh, students who, I guess you did say, don't fit. Uh, as, as I say in my program, uh, I also am part of an alternative learning program. Our virtual learning program has alternative uh, overtones to it. I call it the land of misfit toys sometimes. It's the kids who just did not fit into the traditional school and just need alternative means. How has esports been, I guess, uh, uh, taken, t- how have they taken to esports over the years? Well, I always like to say, uh, because I'm not a gamer, but I've been in uh, here, at, here at Complete High School for 20 years and in education for 25 years. And in those 25 years, I've never seen anything attract kids and engage kids like I have uh, video games and esports. And Mike, what's what's your experience uh, working in alternative ed and working with the children that you're you're servicing? Well, we uh, so this is uh, the first, uh, I guess you could say, after school program that our school's ever had uh, the esports program. So uh, we've uh, we see about eighty two percent of our kids who were never in any club before uh, make up our team now. So those kids uh, were never really engaged in school. So mm-hmm. we're finding esports is a good good way to get them engaged. And then once they're engaged and can kind of figure out that they are good at something or can achieve some goals, then they start to set more goals and become more successful. So, but of course, it's been really great. You didn't just drop this program in. It Looking in, into the backgrounds of the both of you and looking at and reviewing some of the uh, curriculum, the esports curriculum that you both have developed, uh, with HSEL, and, and I think Microsoft helped as well, too, with that effort. Yes. Um, how did you get to this point? So, Christy, let's start with you, Dr. Custer. Let's start with you first. <laughs> um, you're not a typical gamer, as you said. How have you come to this point where you are one of the, an, an administrator who, in an early stage, saw this and went, yes, this is what I need for my student population? At the time, because this is a mom story, and so at the time it was one of those horrible mom moments, but I'm so glad it happened because, uh, first of all, it it was a catalyst to getting me me involved and me going, and then second of all, it makes a great story So for interviews. And so what happened for me was I have a 16-year-old son, a 14-year-old daughter, and then a 7-year-old son, and uh, one day, a beautiful Kansas day, which doesn't happen very often, My son had been uh, down in the basement playing video games for, I like to say, five hours or 10 hours or 50 hours. I have no idea. Mm. And he makes fun of me. I I go crashing down into the basement and, you know, in my mom tone of voice, I'm like, Christian, get off the video games. It's a beautiful day outside. You're wasting your life away on these video games. And uh, he's a good kid, and he looked up at me with those uh, kid, you know, baby boy eyes, and he was like, "Mom, if I had been playing my tuba for three hours, or reading for five hours, or playing basketball for five hours, would you be mad at me?" 
And he said, this is what me and my friends like to do. And this is what we like to do together. And it was at that moment where I really went, you know, I'm not belittling video games. I'm belittling my child. And I had to reconcile that in my mind. And I said, I, I have to do something to make this okay with not just me, but with moms everywhere, that this is more than just sitting in, in the basement, wasting the day away. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, it is something that I've talked about in the past too. And especially when we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic motivations Mm -hmm. Uh, for, for kids, school, a lot of times is an extrinsic motivation. Those of us who work in alternative education know this, especially because a lot of the times we have students who were pushed and pushed and pushed to attend school to the point where they decided this is not the place for me. And when you find something that it is an intrinsic motivation, that is intrinsically motivating for a child, it is, it is very difficult, as you said in the case of your son, for them to hear, oh, that thing you're doing, it's a waste of time. Oh, that thing you're doing, it's, it's a terrible thing to do. But it's something that they love doing. And if you, can, if you can harness that intrinsic motivation that you were talking about for your son to play these games, um, it, it can make all the world a difference, can't it? Absolutely. Uh, um... And it was so stupid because I've, I've been in this world for years and years. And I just, I don't know what the difference was between the two. And, and I think it's because I don't understand that world. And I think that's what happened with a lot of parents. And then I couldn't attach any value to it. Like I could attach value to, to him playing his tuba mm-hmm. because that's a class in school. And I could attach value to him uh you know, playing basketball, because that's something they do in school. And so that's really where that came from is, if we can attach this to something with school, then I think we can make this work. And, and, you know, that's really where Mike came in. So that's a perfect transition to Mike. So (laughs) Mike, you were not an educator by trade to start off your career, you were in business before all this. Uh, Give us a little background into how you arrived in Kansas at, at the complete high school. And, and how you kind of gripped into uh, esports and esports culture? Uh, well, I mean, I've been a I've been a gamer basically my whole life. I played on the start on the Atari twenty six hundred and no and- no wait wait let's start on, stop on that for a second because <laughs> those of us who played the Atari twenty six hundred you don't uh, those of you who are gaming and you're let's say you're gaming using something like this right those of you who yeah. are on the who are watching this i'm holding up i'm not watching this uh, hearing this i'm holding up a microsoft uh, xbox controller those of you who have never gamed on a 2600 do not know the hand cramp that you can get from holding on to a 2600 controller it is it requires a clawed fist almost to hold and to play and and so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but when you say the 2600 it's like there's a hand that you would have to develop, yeah. a strength that you would have yes. to develop in order and to play it. Very strong, you can see right here. So, yeah. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. And so I've been playing that. Luckily, my parents were were supportive of me uh, playing video games. Um, but growing up in that time, the society wasn't as a rule. I mean, my grandparents and and general, uh, you know, your eyes are gonna you're gonna have terrible eyes. You're gonna have terrible vision. You're gonna you know you're not gonna really do anything with your life. So I I heard it all. So. Um, fast forward to 2011, uh, I went to uh, my buddy and I from high school had played World of Warcraft for several years and we heard about uh, BlizzCon obviously and we decided to go to BlizzCon that year 2011 and this is before I was a teacher mm-hmm. but once I saw the esports going on and all the different you know the diversity of people that were there and we're all just getting along and you see just kind of how everything works together and and just the opportunities that were there I thought man this is so amazing so I just kind of filed that in the back of my brain and and uh, a few years later, I decided I was becoming, I was going to become an educator. I had really kind of always wanted to do that. I just, just didn't work out for me until later in life and, mm-hmm. and, and I got into education. And during my interview, uh, we, so Christy and Michelle, our assistant principal interviewed me and, and in our interviews also there's three students. And basically what they do is they sit you down in this interview well, there's a whole precursor to this, but I, I won't, I'll skip all that, but um, uh, we can talk about that again later, but uh, they sit you down and then they, and then Christy and Michelle leave the room. Okay. So they leave you there with the students and seems, they're basically seems perfectly like, normal to me. Yeah. So then, you know, they're basically just trying to see if you're, you know, if you can talk, have a conversation, you know, how things go. And I'm, you know, 
very fortunate that they liked video games and so did I. So we had a common denominator immediately. So they were super stoked about me being a gamer. We talked about StarCraft II and, and some other things. And and fortunately, I got the job at Complete High School. It was a three-hour interview. Um, <laughs> my wife called me a couple of times to make sure I was okay <laughs> and, and got the job. And then, uh, you know, very shortly after that, Christy and I began to talk about, you know, she was very supportive from the beginning of me getting the lab going and trying to get a program going. And she was just basically like, figure it out and, and get it done. And so I started to write some grants and didn't get any of the first year, but got several the second year and got our lab going. Well, what year, what year did you get this started? Um, so we actually, so I, August of 2016 is when the program actually started. Okay. So. So um, we start, it, oh, there wasn't a whole lot of blueprints back then. There wasn't a whole lot of people. In, I think you and I were probably some of the you know people. But again, those of us who who didn't have any blueprints, we were guessing. There was a lot of guessing going on. What uh, I guess let I, I want to kind of dive into this right at this second, just because I think it's important. If starting over now, would there be things you would have done differently? I'll answer part of this. Sure. Uh, what I would have done differently, and it's just because of the lens that I look at everything through, I think that that what happens sometimes in this arena is that uh, we do teacher passion projects is really what this is. And so I ask teachers when they come on board, you know, what what are you passionate about? Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think they that we focus so much on kids and what kids are passionate about, which I think is very important. But if you get a teacher passionate about something, those kids will be on board because they love the teacher. Mm -hmm. And so when I asked Mike what his passion project was, he, you know, was almost shy about it and embarrassed about it. And he said, I love video games. And so, you know, there, there was that connection that I've been looking for, but the lens that, that, typically happens with something like this. And I think James, it happened with you also, you love video games. And so mm -hmm. the lens that you're looking at this from, at least in the beginning was video games as the center. Yep. And for me, I don't really like video games. And so I was, I was looking at, or I should have from the very beginning, I should have looked at curriculum from the very beginning. And we were lucky enough that Mike had the curriculum right here. Like he had enough uh, experience and background in this that he could you know off the cuff what are the kids wanting wanting to do and then he could teach them how to do it and teach them how to do it better but I would have probably uh, inserted the curriculum lens from the beginning had I known what was going to happen I think that uh in, I'm, I'm I think I'm reaching my esports e edu 3.0 moments here uh, the one point <laughs> the one point oh moment is you know, Mike, you're like, hey, you got the okay to launch an esports program. You're like, cool, let's do this. And it's like games and equipment and everything else. And then there's that 2.0 moment where Chris, you're like, hey, the curriculum, the strategic goals, how are you, how are you doing student improvement? Mm -hmm. And I think those things come come in that order typically, though I hope some people are not looking at those things separate anymore. Right. Because um, they are so intertwined. But I think what a lot of it is is that, you know. Mike, and maybe you can relate to this, we've been looking for the okay to have video games in school for so long. We know that they're fun. We know that they're enjoyable. We know that they're socially building. I mean, Mike, you talked about going to BlizzCon and that whole community, that supportive community around World of Warcraft. And I know those World of Warcraft people in there. I won't call it cultish, but I'll say that it's definitely, you people, you, I'm not a World of Warcraft player, but the people who I know who do it, no other people outside and inside the game itself. Um, but it's, it's, it's finding that okay. My moment was when a superintendent came to me and said, hey, I saw in 60 Minutes the other night that Robert Morris University is giving scholarships for esports. Can we do that? And I went, uh, first of all, the assistant superintendents asked me this. So yes, of course I can do this. Um, so yeah, I can see how those things start to evolve uh, now that more people are asking the question, what are, what are my strategic goals? Uh, and, and how is esports going to fit into every one of them to move things forward? Well, I, I think a lot of the curriculum piece, uh, I think we knew, Christy and I knew that in order to make, make it available to students, we had to have a curriculum piece to it. It couldn't be just, 
kids sitting in there playing video games where you you know and I know that those are benefits. They are going to benefit from that. We need some kind of data to show or some kind of outcomes that we're going to have from them doing this. We can't just have them in there playing video games. Now, I would be okay with that, but the people in charge, you know, we have to convince others that this is okay. And and so I think we really we really taught the curriculum for about a year and a half before we even thought about actually writing down the curriculum Mm -hmm. because we wanted to see how that whole we were really just kind of like christy said i kind of talked from my head and then talked to her and then we kind of come up with what's this look like and 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 but we were fortunate to have support from our community and everything and so we were able to do those things where a lot of the schools even couldn't get to that point to where they could even try it you know so hopefully by what we're all doing as a community we're able to open doors so now that people can even just go to their administrators and go, yes, you can get a scholarship to go to Robert Morris, and maybe you are not going to be a competitive video game player, but you might be a human resources manager, but having that experience is going to help you. I went to Purdue University where we didn't even have a school of music, but we have a marching band of over 400 people. Not one person's a music major, and yet we were all part of the marching band. I played rugby. Rugby was a club sport. It wasn't a varsity sport, but we still had it. Those things, those things that socially bind us to the buildings, I think, or to our schools and to our campuses and our universities are so important. And a lot of times, and and my fault included, um, in my in my experience and background and past in Alt Ed, a lot of times Alt Ed is kind of like you're just hoping that they graduate. <laughs> you know, you just you just do whatever you got to do, do those credits, however you're going to do it, we're going to get you to the end. And a lot of times we do miss uh, me, I'm not saying you got you all but we do miss on the importance of having that social bind, I guess, for even those kids in the alt ed programs. Now, you're saying esports was your first, first foray into that. Is there anything else you have found coming out of this that has been a benefit to the students in alt ed through through esports? Well, our biggest piece for me was student engagement. Uh, I think, um, boy, my mind just goes a million different places when we start talking about this piece, part of it. Um, I think if people are always asking us for data, what's the data on esports? You know, show us how this is helping. And I said, the data is already there. It doesn't, all we have to show is that esports is another activity avenue for kids because there's data everywhere about how activities in school no matter what that activity is and activities in school make kids more engaged in school Mm -hmm. if kids are are into activities kids are into uh, better grades better attendance and then all of those things bring up esports and so i mean all of those things bring up bring up academics and so and i i understand where people want the data want the data want the data but I like to say all we have to show is that esports is another viable activity in school, and then all the data is already there. Mm. And so, because uh, esports brings kids to school, and that's why I like to have it in school, like actually part of the academic day, because a lot of our kids have transportation issues, or they don't have, you know, a way to get here after school, or they have to have jobs after school. I love to have it in the school day because it's getting students here and they might come to school for that one hour a day, but they stay at school for the other seven hours a day. And, and, and I've seen this too, and Mike and, and Christy, you can maybe speak to this is, you know, a lot of times too, it's not just having the academic improvement or the attendance improvement, but building those, those connections to kids, um, especially those in all dead, because a lot of times those kids in all dead never had a good connection to a teacher growing up or before they got to you, there was not that one teacher who said, you know, I want to know more about you. I want to develop that relationship with you to 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 have that better adult uh, student relationship. Have you seen that come up through esports? Either of you, a better relationship with students? Yeah, I mean, I mean, by nature, our school is really. I mean, we're a relationship school, so we we did that. Uh, we do that every day, uh, mm-hmm. but. I will say that there, even within that subset of kids, there were kids who I think felt like they were outliers just because they didn't have gaming. And, and now, I mean, it's so amazing to me to walk into the room and you look at our team and I'm just like, how do these people even 
I mean, they don't, they wouldn't know each other outside of this. They would never have associated with each other if mm -hmm. they didn't have esports, right? So, so they're, they're building, you know, relationships with kids that they would have never even talked to before. And, and I guess that's just the beauty of esports and being involved in something. But I mean, I think you find that, like Christy said, in a lot of after school activities or any activity, you know, they're building bridges between kids that may not be together other than their love for that thing that they're doing. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really amazing to see the kids and just come out of their shell. It's, you know, we would talk about someone so is so quiet, but then you get them in front of a gaming computer and boom, they're just like you know, loud and proud and in charge and ready to go. So in game uh, leader. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there are, there are definitely kids that you would never think had any leadership in them at all until they get in there. And then they're, they're really in charge and they love to, to share strategies and go over things. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's really awesome to see. Well, and for the first time in their life, they're finding something in school that they're good at or they're successful at. Uh, the self-confidence, this is now part of school. And look, I'm good at school. And, you know, before, you know, just like me and my son, I, I had told him over and over, get off video games, get off video games. They're stupid. They're worthless. They're you know, and now he, I mean, he just, it blows his mind, you know, that I'm the esports girl now and uh, it's hard. For, and it, for the kid, like Christy said, to find success, I mean, we'll introduce a new game into the lab sometimes, just something out of the blue. And the kids will be like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then two weeks later, like I did this, I did this and now I'm doing this and I'm doing this. So, uh, you know, once I, once I think someone shows that they can be successful or have success at something, they want to achieve more success. I think it's, it gives them the, the, the gumption to go out and get it and do, and do better. And, and I think so many of our kids have never felt success or didn't know it was successful because nobody, either nobody told them or they never really had, had tried. And, and I think this allows them to do that. I mean, we give them the chance to, and Christy talks more about perseverance. She tells the story much better than I do, but uh, you know, give them a chance to fail and, and that's okay. We all learn from failure. I learned a lot more from failure than I have success. So. <laughs> and is, and I, and I understand it. You compete in the high school esports league, but what I'm also hearing is that there's a casual game experience as well too, as part of your program. Is that, is that, is that right? What I hear? Yeah. So we, uh, the, I would say the class is more the casual is kind of where anybody should sign up and and I love it when the new kids sign up because the kids who have never gamed we have a lot of kids you know I mean 95 percent of them have played a video game in some fashion but only about half of them have ever played on a pc mm. and so that whole pc dynamics a little bit different for them because that's that's all we have in the lab but it gives the kids who are experienced on pc a lot of mentoring opportunities and they're they're very eager to help and show kids, uh, you know, that are new to it and how to move and do all those things and, and the strategies in the games. But uh, it is it is really cool to see that. Um, oh, God, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Go, Christy. <laughs> While you're jumping in, uh, I'll just jump in on, on that casual piece. Also, uh, schools are, when Mike talked about perseverance, what happened with that is the, the commissioner of education he, uh, we have a big redesign program going on in the state of Kansas, as with most, most states are trying to, you know, bring education along to the 21st century. And so he uh, surveyed business people um, throughout the state. And what kept popping up was he, he made a graphic of all the traits that business people were looking for. And biggest in there was perseverance. And along the way, there were things like, you know, are you on time for work and, and uh, just, you know, all of those soft skills that you typically see. And, you know, as educators, we all looked up at this big graphic and there was no math and social studies and science, you know, there, none of that was really in there because business people, obviously you have to have those skills. You have to be able to read, but, you know, especially at the high school level, what we're teaching, you know, kids are graduating and they're quitters. And so we had to really reevaluate. Wait, that's a, that's a really interesting statement. No, no. <laughs> and you're talking about that from the traditional high school mm -hmm. perspective, right? Yeah. Not the alt ed, because I would say the alt ed kids. Absolutely. You have to have that perseverance in order to complete an alt ed program because that is 
that is drag kicking and screaming sometimes over to the finish line. But, you know, we know a lot of kids too, who just don't finish. And a lot of it just has to do with that getting up and coming every day and being part of something every day. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Definitely. But when we really started looking then, you know, where do we teach perseverance in schools? And a lot of it comes from activities, but schools are not set up for kids to fail because what happens if you take a risk? Let's say I take a class that might be a little above me. What happens to my grade point average? You know, sure. or if I, if I take a test and I fail it, you know, there's typically a reduction of your grade. Um, even if you retake it and do well, a lot of people, you know, well, you, you can't, it's you don't already give them full credit, you give no. them half credit or whatever it is. Right. And so it's schools aren't just, they're not set up for failure. They are set up for you learn it, you pass it, you move on. And mm -hmm. what we're finding with esports is like Mike said, kids get in there and they, they are eliminated because we don't say die. <laughs> they are eliminated, eliminated, eliminated. They fail, they fail, they fail. And for some crazy reason, they get back up and try again and they try again and they try again. And I mean, it's just like, it's the magic key, the magic fairy dust that, that you sprinkle on that they, they're just, they love it. And then if this is where the education piece and this is where the teacher piece comes into it, then you start trans transferring that into real life. Hey, you couldn't do that a week ago. You said you hated this game a week ago. And look at you. Look what you've done with some practice. Look what you've done because you showed up every day. Mm -hmm. It's just that authentic uh, avenue where kids, you know, they'll buy in. And then you start, you know, how teachers were masters at. We trick them into learning. And, and that's really what we're trying to do. And I think we, we probably could all have at least one story of that one kid who, you know, again, as you were saying, um, I had one who she came to me and said, uh, I'm never going to make varsity. And I said, first of all, you're a sophomore. Second of all, when did you start playing Overwatch? And she said, oh, I started playing it in August. I'm like, it's November and you're a starter on an Overwatch team. I mean, for some of the kids, they just don't even, you, know, you need to almost say that to them, that they, that look at all of the wonderful things you've done and you don't even realize that you, what you've done is incredibly hard. <laughs> well, that's so, another good point that you, I mean, talking about, you know, being, going from starting in August to being on the team in November. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of esports. I mean, that's one of the beauties of it is it's, if kids put the time in and they're, and they have mentoring, you know, people there to help them, they can be good really fast. I mean, mm -hmm. they can get caught up to, to the meta and everything uh, really quickly if, if you work with them. And, and that's one of the other beauties that we're finding is kids aren't scared to try out because they haven't been playing football since they were five years old. They can't make the high school team now because they just can't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have this to where it's open and people, you know, we've had kids who've never touched it and then make the team. I mean, like you said, it's, that's a, one of the beautiful things right now of, of esports. Well, let's get into how you've kind of put together the official program. So you've got your course, um, and as, as Dr. Custer, as you were saying, Mike had it all up here in his head, and then you all decided to start writing it down. What made you finally go and say and sit down and go, you know what? We had better write this down. Well, that's kind of a funny story, too. This is, funny. This is a good story. All right. I love a story. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started having conversations. So it started to get around that complete, here's what we're doing and that we're doing this during school. And we actually got this approved um, as a four credit class. It, it was for a business credit. And so, you know how, I mean, the education community is so small. And so that really started to get around and um, people started asking, how do we get this into our schools? And the high school esports league, a lot of people would call them and say, Hey, we hear there's this school that you uh, that plays with you guys. You know, where can we get their curriculum? And, and so we would be on meetings just like this. And they kept asking, You know, why, how can we do this with other schools? And, and we kept saying, You know, finally we narrowed it down. And, and I said, You have to have a mic to be able to do this, you have to have a mic. A Mike and Russell, not a, a microphone. Russell, not yeah. this kind of mic, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You have to have a Mike Russell. And, um, well, obviously not every school has that. And they're like, well, we can't do that. So what else? And 
we said, well, yeah, then you have to have a textbook because that's what teachers do. We, we teach from textbooks. And, and uh, I said, especially, you know, this won't always be like that, but right now teachers look like me. 80% of high school teachers look like me. They're middle-aged women. Mm-hmm. And so that doesn't bode well either for esports right now. Uh, so they were like, well, where can we get this textbook? And Mike and I laughed and said, exactly, because we looked everywhere for a textbook. And there just, there was none. And I mean, we were even looking in other countries and talking to people from other countries. And so one day, this was in October, <laughs> one day, I, I just got tired of hearing about it. And I looked at Mike and we were sitting side by side in a meeting just like this. And I looked at Mike and I go, look, we'll write one. And Mike, <laughs> his eyes are it's like, like this. <laughs> we will. <laughs> and so really. Um, and that's not for the faint of heart. No, no, I, no, no. I, I no. mean, to put it in perspective, I sat with a group of high school social studies teachers once. And, it, this is a, and we were talking about open educational resources. And I said, you know, why should we go buy a textbook when we could just put the textbook together ourselves? And I swear to God, and I don't want to, I'm not going to give away the name or the school district, but the teacher looked at me and said, I don't feel I'm qualified to write a textbook. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking like, you're teaching the class. You should probably be qualified to write a textbook. But yeah. it is, even if you're, even if you know all the content, which obviously Mike does, that is a daunting task. Yeah, it, it's, it is. And I guess this is where where I came in because complete high school um, has always been individualized instruction, and so and it's standards based. And so you know we we're not seat time, so we throw out we throw out all the fluff. You know that for You're seat saying time. everything that is music to my ears. Keep talking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and so it was like my whole life prepared me for this moment. And and I had done curriculum before because it's almost a, a savant for me now. It's a second nature, you know, just because I've been doing it for such a long time. And so I don't know anything about esports, but you give me a topic and I will write curriculum. And so this is where the disconnect, though, between the business world and the education world comes in. They were like, okay, great. You know, when can you have this? And they're thinking, you know, I don't know, the summer or something like that. Well, what we know as educators is if we don't drop this by February, we miss an entire year Mm -hmm. because classes, uh, you're enrolled in February. That's when they start enrollment. And see, the business world, they didn't, or or the High School Esports League, and, and a lot of people just didn't understand that, that if we don't get this done right now, uh, we're going to miss it for a whole year, pretty much. And so uh, Mike and I just put our heads together and uh, he told me topics and um, I told him topics because as, as the parent, I knew if we were going to sell this as the parent, I knew we needed to appeal to parents and and administrators. And he would write the curriculum that I was very familiar with. And I would write the curriculum that he was very familiar with so that this teacher could step into the classroom with no background. Because what we knew was teachers don't need to know how to play video games. Most of my my general managers have not played some of these games that they're asked to be the overseer of. Because the the kids know how to play the video games, but teachers need to teach. And so that's just, we just kept telling each other, just teachers need to teach, teachers need to teach. And so the curriculum is not about video games and teaching how to play video games. The curriculum is about taking all those valuable skills that video games teach and turning that into education ease, mm-hmm. you know, taking the language out of there and, and translating it for educators. And so that's really what we, we tried to do and we did it. <laughs> it. It is truly, it is truly one of the hardest things too. I mean, again, you don't have a Mike Russell. Okay. So you don't have a Mike Russell, what do you do? And for some educators, because we are so used to being the content experts in the room or used to being the sage on the stage and as much as say whatever you will about how you think teaching should be, there's nothing that makes a teacher more uneasy than going into a class to teach something they know very little about. I mean, it sounds to everybody else in the world who may be listening to this, you may go, well, of course, that sounds silly. But guess what? As a teacher whose job it is, is to educate other people, 
there is nothing scarier than not knowing what you're about to go in and teach. I don't know how sub I don't know how substitute teachers do it sometimes. Because those kids will read right through you and they will eat you alive in a classroom. Yes. And <laughs> and as as we love our alternative ed students and we're meeting them where they're at, those are the ones who who catch that weakness probably the fastest because again, they they're the most demanding students, but they're also, when you reach them, the most satisfying students to reach when it comes to when they, that light switch. I remember, you probably have a story like this. I had a student, it took her two and a half years to complete Algebra One Semester One. As soon, though, as she finished Algebra One Semester One, Semester Two and Geometry just kind of flew by. It was, right. You know, as soon as you, you hit that switch, but again, those students are going to be the ones who are your most demanding kids in all of this. So again, as you're, as you're talking about that curriculum, I can see how mission critical that curriculum can really be. And talk about it for a second, because you know, the people go thinking you're going, it's free to download. Uh, there's a link in the podcast notes, so you'll be able to see it. But for some people, they're like, well, what the heck am I teaching here? So what's included in it? Is it just, is it just video games? So I see, there, I saw video games, I saw, health and wellness. I saw movement. I saw ergonomics. I saw uh, tech, uh, like how to overclock your people. What, what are we talking about? I even saw things like creating a logbook. So what, what are we talking about here? Well, and Mike, before I'll let you take over what you're teaching, some more of the background. We've, we, the other, there was a lot of pressure because we knew we, we really needed to get this right. Mm -hmm. it, especially since we're going to put that much work into it. And that was one of our big things. I said, I don't, we're, we're serious about this and, and we didn't want to work so hard on something and then not have it go out. But that's when Microsoft picked us up and, and then there was even more pressure on us and, and the high school league sports league said, we will blast this out. Well, there were no standards. There, there was no starting place even. And it's really not still. Well, no. and we, we'd even looked at the ISTE standards, but the ISTE standards, which they're wonderful, but the ISTE standards focused more on Mike, give me the words. The like oh, the, correct, the, correct, collaboration, communication, yeah. creativity. Well, and really like the, the technical stuff, the there more technical go. side of things, not the soft skills that mm -hmm. and and uh, and the career and career development and social emotional learning and stuff like that. The ISTE standards are all about can you code, can you do all these other things with the technology? We're using the technology to do something else. Right. And so what we what our ultimate goal then, and this is what I think really helped us is we saw a new pathway. There is a new curricular pathway. Um, and, and just for your listeners that aren't familiar with that, so there will be like a, if you want to be a teacher in high school, you can take a pathway that will lead you into teaching. And if you want to be an engineer, there's a pathway that would lead you to engineering. And if you want to be in the, in the uh, food service industry, uh, there's a pathway. We believe there's a pathway here. And so we didn't just want to write curriculum that could be sprinkled into English or math or science or social studies, because as a former English teacher, I got enough crap to teach, mm. you know? <laughs> so we wanted something all by itself so that eventually this gets picked up as there is a pathway that leads to esports. And, you know, we were a little bit vindicated because now there's all these colleges with these esports uh, degrees. So it's I'm moving in the right direction. I'm very, let's talk about that for a second, because I'm, I, I, I feel like where a lot of us are is eSports 1.0 or eSports 2.0. I think the colleges still haven't realized just how powerful of a teaching opportunity this is using eSports as a vehicle. Um, I look at Ohio State's program. I look at Staffordshire University or even to, to a, a lesser extent, some of the other schools that just say, oh, we're going to have a certification. And, and I just go, like, for example, I've been having uh, conversations with my own alma mater, Purdue University, and talking to them about, you have this amazing engineering program. Do you realize just how important those clicks are, those nanosecond clicks and the patent rights? If you create something that is that eliminates a lot of that 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 those nanoseconds and milliseconds of clicks, the patents that could come out of that. And of course, there's going to be kids who are going to obsess over developing, you know, that mouse, uh, you can't see it, the mouse that is 
that reduces those those clicks you know whatever you create universities i think haven't realized just how big of a of a of a because again taking those intrinsic motivations kids love to play these games kids love to be part of it and and hooking them in that way and saying now let's apply physics and science and everything else they haven't just gosh they just haven't gone below that surface yet have you seen below have you guys seen below the surface you know again using esports as the vehicle and then the kid who a story of maybe a kid who just takes it and goes oh i'm applying this now into other things well, I think, well, uh, go ahead, Mike. I, I would say, speaking of Kansas, I mean, I would say there's a couple, you know, I think the people who have started these companies have done that. I mean, <laughs> as a college, they didn't have that support, but uh, I, I mean, they're Ramsey Jamul owns Midwest Esports and then the guys that own HSEL, you know, Macy and Charlie and AJ. I mean, they took esports and they made it into something. And, mm -hmm. and I think where colleges, I think the main focus for colleges right now is one recruitment. It's a great recruiting tool. They get sure. more students in, but there are the programs that we've seen that I've seen anyway, are mostly focused on the esports management side of things. So they're, they're kind of doing like a sports management with an esports endorsement basically on there. So, but yeah, there's so many opportunities uh, like shout casting and then, uh, you know, video production and all the other things that go into esports. I mean, so much of, and I can only speak to BlizzCon, but so much of BlizzCon is not esports. It's all the other stuff, right? It's the people who direct the shows and run all the different stages, and and so they, I think I think they're they they need to get their esports programs to where those funnel in or they use those other programs to create positions out of that. So it's it's it might be a human resources job with an emphasis on esports, you know, working in an esports company or something like that. But we're not really seeing that yet, kind of to your point. So um, I've really just seen the esports management and there's not too many schools that I even think have really gotten that far yet. So what I think part of the issue might be too is when you think of your department heads at your colleges, are they gamers? Do they, no. It's no. very difficult to understand this world unless you live in this world. And, and most academics don't live in this world. And this will speak to the salesman that Mike is. Uh, he tricked me because he's a good, great teacher. And he said, hey, do you want to go to BlizzCon? And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to be supportive of my teachers. What's BlizzCon? <laughs> And he how, said, it's, how did that go for you? Well, he said, how, it, it's out in, I said, where's it at? And he said, it's in Anaheim, California. Right there. Uh -huh. yeah. And here's the mom. That's where Disneyland is. So I can take my kids out there and I'll please the teacher. And my son can go to this BlizzCon thing. And I'll pop in and look at it. I walked into that place. And all of a sudden, I completely understood how this is a pathway. I mean, that's really when my mind went, this is not about gamers and game developers, which as a someone outside of the industry, in my mind, when you say esports, you think gamers and, and game developers. We walk, first of all, I stood in line with 10,000 people. What in the world? Who sold all these tickets? But I walked in and I stood in line for merchandise and then spent $100 on merchandise this is not about, this is about a culture. This is about community. I mean, this is a whole thing. And colleges haven't yet, college academics, college, uh, I guess the people in charge, they just haven't seen far enough down the lane to see where this is going. I feel, I feel that um, because I went to TwitchCon back in October. So like BlizzCon in a lot of ways, but a little different. Standing in line with, again, 10,000 people. But here's the amazing thing about that. It's 10,000 people all trying to develop their own personal brand. It's, like, it's almost like a branding convention more than, hey, here's Twitch and here's how you use it. No, it was like, here's, here's all these people who just feel like they want to be individuals and tell their story and sell themselves and put themselves out there. And I know BlizzCon, between the, the gameplay, the community, and the it's, – these are things that, gosh – you know, in schools, we hope kids are part of a positive community. We want kids to find others who are like them in this world who share passions and love. And we want kids to share their passions and love with us. I mean, there's always, you know, there's always that cheesy 80s, 90s 
mo movie where it's like, oh, the troubled kid from the other side of the tracks. So then you find out, oh, well, he's really an amazing gamer or he's in an amazing rock band or, or she has this, you know, this really interesting trait about her that nobody ever knew about. This is, this to me has opened up worlds for kids who just have now this, this amazing opportunity to share passions and loves of things that they have that they thought they had to keep to themselves. That they and and now they get to share them with adults. There's nothing I've seen more excited yeah. than a group of seniors who I said, "Would you be interested in teaching senior citizens how to play Overwatch?" Oh my gosh, they just like leapt out of their chairs at me. They're like, "Yes, we would love to teach senior citizens yeah. how to play Overwatch." They want to share this culture. It's amazing. Um, yeah, absolutely. So to, as we get close to the end here, I, I have one final big question um, related to the curriculum itself. The curriculum was developed about two years ago now. Is that correct? Wrote, written down about two years ago. Yeah. Knowing yeah. just how much esports has evolved over the last, you know, we, we started this, Mike, you and I, roughly 14, 15, 16. What is the curriculum 2.0 going to include? What's going to be the next version? What is, what is a big update that you go, you know what, this is something that the first time we wrote this, we missed this, and now we want to include this in it the next time. They see you smiling. You got to have something. We, we don't like to say it out loud because that kind of commits us to doing it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, <laughs> even if it's even if it's not something that's necessarily a lesson or something like that, what is something that you you go back and you go, gosh, I wish we had included at least an element of this in it. So, so there will be a, a, a I'm confident a version 2.0 of the gaming concepts curriculum. The 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 next thing on our radar is the middle school gaming concepts curriculum. So. That's um, what we're working on right now. So that'll be, uh, that's really our focus at this point. I mean, we're, um, I know one thing that we probably won't put in the next version is router basics because Christy <laughs> gives me all kinds of stuff about why is that in there? So I don't know. I thought it was important. Maybe not so much. I don't know. But kids, even, just, kids just think the Wi-Fi comes from heaven. I don't know. So I put it in there. <laughs> but, you know, Mike, what's interesting about that is about two years ago, routers were even incredibly different where it was like you had to go in and you had to like put in specific codes and numbers and ports and everything else. Nowadays, you can go on your phone through an app and go, okay, I want this device to have priority over everything else now, which when my son found out about that, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, why is my whole network slow? Oh no, he just he just dedicated all the resources to the <laughs> he game. He has pieces. all the internet right now on his <laughs> phone. <Yep>. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but really and, and with that because there's a, there's a ton of interest in the in the middle school and um we are in that we're all about character ed around here we we believe that character ed is the plate that everything else sits on and if we can't graduate i, I want to graduate good good people good humans good citizens and if, if they're good people and good humans and good citizens, everything else falls into place. And so we're really going to focus on uh, the character ed piece for the middle school, because a lot of people are like, well, how, how does that look? And so we think that there's, you know, that toxicity that starts in middle school. That middle school, and you'll know this as, as all, all ed, middle school is where everything falls apart for kids, you know. It comes and, together. It, yes. it's, it's that make or break. It you is. Know, it is. And it's because, you know, in, in elementary school, they had that teacher that was like the, the mama duck that herded her ducklings along and she called everybody our friends and she made you get along. Mm -hmm. And then in middle school, they hit that, you know, five, six, seven teachers and, and God bless them all, but they don't always, you know, see what's going on. And so my phone's ringing. Sorry. That's okay. You're right. Well, while she's doing that, the digital, digital citizenship is going to come in quite you know, quite a big hot topic right now. So, um, and a lot of what we do with the curriculum is focusing on those traits, you know, being good online behavior and stuff like Chrissy was just talking about. So but we're, I think what we're hoping is that we can enroll out these curriculum for people and they can use that as their digital citizenship course. People, you know, schools are doing like a whole nine weeks of digital citizenship. Well, we could do that with this program and, and expose all the kids to the, to the gaming or not. I mean, we could use the curriculum as another way, an avenue to reach them as well. So, well, and as I've seen it too, it doesn't have to be, it's not end to end. It is, it can be taken in parts, pieces, sure. and people have the abilities to uh, remix it as they need to, correct? They have the rights to do that. I mean, it, I didn't see anything that restricted you down and saying, like, you have to do things this way. Mm -hmm. And Christy, your point about the, the elementary, my, my first, I, I am an elementary educator by 
training and my first few years of teaching, I, I taught fifth grade students and in a building that was six, five through eight. And I know exactly what you're talking about with those fifth graders who are in a self-contained class who then go off to the middle school and you just look at them, they come back to you in sixth grade and you're like, why are you acting like this? Right. You know? So I understand completely <laughs> that, that, on, that concept seeing it firsthand. Um, as we start to uh, complete uh, the interview right now, um, is there anything else that you wish to share? Anything you wish to get out from either of you? Uh, places where people can, obviously there's gonna be a link uh, to the curriculum here, but is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? My big share that people are often shocked about is typically when we get to the end, because we kind of forget, uh, it's zero dollars for you to have this curriculum in your school. And so that makes people happy. And, and that really came from, you know, where we came from. Uh, there's no reason that Complete High School May should be as successful as, as it's been. And we didn't want this to be something where um, there was haves and have nots, that you could afford it. And, and you came from a school that could afford it because because we were the have nots for a long time. And so we really want everybody just to have the opportunity to have it. And Mike and I are are always available. I, I had neglected one of our sites where teachers asked for help and we had a hundred emails Oh, on geez. that, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people are really looking at it right now, and so uh, uh, if anybody needs help, the community is so wonderful that um, you know. I think you reach out to any gamer or, or curriculum person, and they're going to help you with it. And, and Mike, do you have anything else you wish to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to. I mean, obviously, thank you for having us on. This has been great, and um, uh, I'd like to thank. You know, the Varsity Esports Foundation, if people are looking to get, if they are having trouble getting a program started and, and maybe need some help with funding or something, please reach out to Bubba over there. Um, they're great people to work with. If, if you're fortunate enough to have some money laying around right now and you want to donate to the Varsity Esports Foundation, please do that also. Um, uh, they, they use that money and they use, uh, they use it for good. So, um, and of course, I like to thank uh, the guys at HSEL. They've been really great to us and Microsoft for helping us. And, and I would also encourage um, educators out there to go get the badge. If you're into that, the Microsoft educator community, if you're into getting those badges and those points, go on there and take mine. the course. Yeah, go out there and take the course. And, and uh, that you know, just helped us spread the word. The curriculum is also available on there. Uh, if you want to grab it from there also. So yeah. I, I have I have been becoming more and more appreciative of the HSEL group as I, I you know, I'm always one who looked at things from a side eye, you know, especially with esports, as people are rushing into this, you almost have to like go, who is this really? And what are they trying to do? What is their angle? But HSEL people have been around for a long time. Um, they are a for-profit company, but I still feel like they have, they will work with you when it comes to, hey, we're having difficulties coming up with funding or anything like that. And, and again, they're a community of gamers by gamers. And, and uh, again, they work in close concert with Varsity Sports Foundation. So even if you are having issues uh, of getting uh, computers or anything like that, they, they will help out. So, yeah. So Mike Russell and Dr. Christy Custer, thank you so much for being on the Academy of Esports podcast today. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Appreciate it. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N and through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash taoesports. 
Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.